Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. During a recent live stream, I was asked to do a video on the gray line. I did a video some months ago explaining the basic concepts of the gray line on the whiteboard. You can see this video as Ask Dave number 460. I thought I would expand on that a little bit here. We're going to take a look at what the ionosphere really looks like and why the gray line is such a tempting vehicle for long distance contacts. This beautiful picture is taken from the International Space Station. It looks at the sunset on the horizon. The key thing it shows is how so very thin the atmosphere really is. The radius of the Earth is about 6,400 kilometers or 4,000 miles. That is huge compared to the thickness of the atmosphere. The sensible atmosphere, meaning the atmosphere with any significant pressure, is very thin compared to the Earth as seen in this picture. In fact, the International Space Station circles the Earth just above the blue layer shown in this picture. Of course, we think of the atmosphere as being everywhere, but we recognize that pressure goes down as we go up. For example, climbers of Mount Everest often need to bring their own oxygen to breathe. Even where I live here in Ridgeway, Colorado, the atmospheric pressure is significantly less than the 14.6 pounds per square inch at sea level. For this reason, a lot of people who visit Colorado find that they must adapt to the high altitude. Let's look at this Wikipedia chart. This shows the layers of the atmosphere. The lowest layer is called the troposphere. The somewhat arbitrary division between the troposphere and the stratosphere is about 12 kilometers, which is about 39,000 feet. Some modern airliners cruise higher than this. One of the reasons that they go that high is that most weather, although not all weather, is limited to the troposphere. So if a plane flies in the stratosphere and avoids the biggest of the thunderstorms, it will have very smooth air for traveling. Just as an aside, look at the line labeled T. The temperature scale at the bottom is in degrees Kelvin, so for reference, subtract about 300 or so for a Celsius scale. Note that as we go up in the troposphere, the temperature goes down. And then as you climb in the stratosphere, it goes up slightly. Then as you go up in the mesosphere, it goes down quite a bit. And then as you go up through the thermosphere, it climbs. Now, mind you, temperature is a measure of how agitated the atoms are in a gas. And in the thermosphere, which is where the ionosphere is, the atoms are quite agitated and moving around. However, there are so few atoms at that height that to use the term temperature is almost meaningless. But let's look over at the line that is labeled both E and F. This is the ionosphere. Note that the peak electron density in the F layer is at about 300 kilometers. The International Space Station actually flies just above that. But there are quite a number of low Earth orbit satellites that fly below that. Although there is a bit of atmosphere at that height, which will slow the spacecraft down a bit, thus requiring fuel to keep the satellite boosted in its orbit, it really is pretty close to a vacuum up there. And this is where the ionosphere is. So when we're talking about the height of the E and F layers of the ionosphere, we're really talking about outer space. This chart, also from Wikipedia, shows the layers of the ionosphere at night and during the day. At night, there is a definite F layer, which during the day breaks into the F2 and F1 layers. Similarly, the E layer, which is a little more sporadic than the F layer, splits into the E and the D layers during the daytime. 
Notice the transition between day and night is not shown on this diagram. So let's look at this diagram, also from Wikipedia. This diagram is definitely not to scale. The combination of the F1 and F2 layers into the F layer at night takes place only about 300 kilometers above the Earth, whereas this diagram shows it to take place at the thousand or so miles above the Earth, as is also true with the other two layers. Now, if you draw a line down from where the layers combine down to the Earth, you'll see that it takes place at about the day-night terminator. Now, let's talk about something that's very important. The atmosphere, as shown in the very first picture, clings pretty tightly to the Earth. So every morning, the F layer splits into the F1 and F2 layers, and then as the Earth rotates around, in the evening, they recombine. So there's a lot of mixing of these layers that occurs at sunset and sunrise. This turmoil can be very useful for some unusual and very long-distance propagation. The ionosphere is not a nice smooth thing and moves all over the place. The number of electrons that we have depends on how much the ultraviolet emissions from the sun lead to ionization. The ionizing radiation from the sun is quite variable, but largely follows an 11-year cycle that is the same cycle as the number of sunspots on the surface of the sun. Right now, the sun is just starting to become active on cycle number 25. And over the next two or three years, we're going to see some improvements in propagation, including during the mixing between daylight and night. Now, I'm going to show you some shots from a piece of software I have from a Freet software called DX Atlas. We're going to use this to introduce the concept called gray line. Gray line is defined as the time between sunset and dark, or between dark and sunrise. Note that the gray line is not quite as well defined as that, but it happens to coincide with all the mixing that's going on in the ionosphere. It shows on this picture of the globe as the gray band around the Earth. Now, if you want to access it, you will need to be in your station from a little before sunset until a little bit after twilight ends and it becomes dark, or from somewhere before sunrise until somewhat time after sunrise. That puts you in the gray line. Now, I'm going to do some things here with the globe to show what happens through the year. Right now, we are very close to the autumnal equinox, and you will see that the gray line is fairly vertical on the Earth because the sun is nearly over the equator. But let's run time forward by a couple months and you will see that very different parts of the Earth are in the gray line. The point here is that as the seasons move on, the spots on Earth that inhabit the gray line at the same time change quite radically. So that means if you take advantage of gray line propagation, which often works at much higher frequencies than would normally be the case, at different times of the year, you can access different parts of the globe. With a piece of software such as DX Atlas, you can actually predict where that will be. That's actually pretty cool. So there you have it. The point of this is that the gray line is a much underutilized way of finding DX, or in other words, faraway stations in other countries. One great way to do this is with FT8. You will want to try higher frequencies, such as 6 meters, 10 meters, 12 meters, or 15 meters, to see what kind of propagation you can get. Now, I will admit that during the sunrise gray line period, I'm still asleep. Meanwhile, on the other side of the earth, people are eating dinner, and vice versa. So you may want to try getting up early and trying the gray line to see what you can get. You may see some very unusual propagation. Make some comments to this video about your experiences with the gray line. If you have watched the video this far, 
I would urge you to subscribe. Your subscription does not create any obligation on your part, but it does act as a vote of confidence to YouTube that this is a channel worth watching. Please also click the thumbs up. To support this channel financially, visit decastercom support. One of the options for support is Patreon. One of the cool things about Patreon is that once a week, you will get an early view of a video that has not yet been posted on YouTube for public release. I appreciate all your support. I also want to talk about the giveaway. Once a month, I'm giving away one item out of my too extensive collection of amateur radio stuff. The current giveaway is number two during the month of September 2021. To participate, send me a postcard, QSL card, or single page letter by snail mail with the following information. The giveaway number, your name, call sign, shipping address, and in case I have any questions, your phone number. Send this to Dave Kassler, PO Box 98, Ridgeway, Colorado, 81432. During the live stream on September 30th, I will draw one name from the pile and send giveaway number two. Giveaway number two is a My Antennas N-Fed half-wave 80 through 10 meter dipole antenna. I previously reviewed this antenna and found it to be pretty good. It covers a small portion of 80 meters, plus all of the 40 meter through 12 meter bands and part of the 10 meter band. Don't forget to attend the Thursday live streams, which are at 6.45 p.m. United States Mountain Time every week. If you wish to ask a question, you can send it to hamradioanswers, all one word, at gmail.com. Or you can go to www.ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. I get quite a few questions, so I regret that I cannot answer all the questions, but I've been trying recently to get to more of them. Also note that I have a column in every issue of QST called Ask Dave. It's usually around page 50. Thank you so much for supporting my channel. Until we next meet, 73.